Okay, I think I'm going to end it there. I mean, uh, you said you're eight out of ten relative to your peers. Yeah, I would I would put you there. Before we continue with today's video, guys, I want to highlight today's sponsor, and that is me. I built this platform called GetCrack.io, and I did it because I noticed that there was a really large gap between what candidates need to know in terms of the knowledge-related questions and what candidates know, which is effectively only lead code. Now that companies are moving away from lead code, this is going to be the platform that you want to invest a lot of your time in. There's a bunch of different topics ranging from language knowledge, operating systems, networking, design patterns, concurrency, etc., and you can really test and hone your skill set here. So if you're competitive, you want to see how well you know Python or C++ or operating systems, this is a platform for you. So make sure to check it out. C++ is what I've been using most recently or trying to prep for. Okay. And what would you say your degree of like professional C++ experience is? is um, in, and let me, in comparison to my peers, I mean, maybe like an eight in comparison to like an actual uh, like quant dev, maybe like much lower maybe like a four well i'm gonna but, judge you against your peers because that's what okay. the, that's what the firm that you applied for judged you against uh it's my third internship it's my first one um in the quant industry okay but it's your first gig outside of uh school yeah it's i mean so it's i mean it's like a normal summer internship because i'm going to do a master's afterwards but yeah Got effectively. It. and what's your master's going to be in also computer science just different specialization okay i would say like simple character types so, how big is a char in C++? Oh, uh, it's just one byte. And is it signed or unsigned? I believe that's implementation defined. Right. And so, if I was to check if a char is a unsigned type, what library or assigned type, what library might I use to do that check? Um... I believe it's something within the standard but library. There's like is... I know there's like the is same type V. Right. I know it's not the same as, there's probably a, um, I don't know the exact function name, but I assume there's something within the standard library to check. Yeah, that, that's the right, that's one of the methods that I'd look at. Do you know what library it's contained in? Oh, like those uh, namespace, not exactly, no. Okay, it's, uh, in type traits. That's not as important. Um, you know, nobody's going to deduct points in an actual re interview based off something like that, whether you know the, the exact name of the library. What's the difference between a vector and an array? This is probably one of the most basic questions. Yeah, so, I mean, in C++, like, in all languages, it's mainly the fact that vector is dynamically resizable, yeah. whereas in Array, we would need to know the size at compile time. Okay, and do I need to specify the size, or can the compiler, did, you know, deduce that for me? We're talking about a uh, vector or Array? An Array. Um, when you say deduce, what do you mean? So can I write std array and then just give it like uh, curly brace one two three and curly brace? I I want to say there's a constructor for that. Um, yeah, I, I guess I would say yes. I, I I don't know if the like the list initializer is deleted for like std array. No, it's not deleted. Um, this has not. It's not to do with constructors. It's more to do with in C plus plus seventeen you can actually emit a lot of these types and the sizes for these sorts of arrays because there's template argument deduction. Mm -hmm. So you can just write std array, pass it, you know, one, two, three in an initializer list and the compiler will deduce the type and size for you. So you don't actually have to specify the exact, you know, int and then three, for example. Right, okay, yeah. Yeah. So now that we're speaking about kind of like functions and arguments and what's going to be returned where by who, um, if I was to write, uh, you know, foo, and I want to pass in uh, the result of the call to the method A, and then the second parameter is the result of the call to method B, what order are these parameters evaluated in? Yeah, I believe that's unspecified behavior because the evaluation of arguments or the order of evaluation for arguments isn't defined. Okay. Or isn't specified, rather. Yeah, that's right. Now, what if I had A and B like before, but for A, I had C in that was called inside of A. So A needed to be seated with the result of function C. Mm -hmm. Would that make a difference? So j just to clarify, this is, so we have param parameters are function A and function B, and function A takes another parameter of C? Yes. 
So I believe the only guarantees there is that function, so A would not be evaluated before C, because C would be fully evaluated before we start evaluating A, I believe. Yeah. But does the fact that C is now called in A mean that A needs to be called first? Ooh, um, I don't think so. Yeah, you're right, doesn't need to. Um, okay, uh, I want to talk about a little bit about the virtual keyword. Sure. So what does it do and what is the implication on a class that has at least one virtual method? Yeah, so I believe virtual keyword is like uh, C++'s main mechanism for dynamic dispatch. Okay. So effectively we have like class shape, right? Um, I don't know, let's say we want to have some size method. Uh, we want like some square class to be able to inherit that. Uh, essentially we'd have it, have this virtual method of size, which can be overridden by square and that can be implemented to give the area of a square. Um, and you mentioned like the implication of that is uh, because Say for example, if we had like um, some pointer to shape um, like during our program, and we didn't know when that was called, whether that would be you know a square or a circle or some other shape, yeah. um, we would do dynamic dispatch, and we'd have to follow a V pointer to access the V table and get the correct function to code. Okay, and so what what implication does that have on the class? So I understand that it's used for dynamic dispatch. Mm -hmm. And at runtime, it allows you to change the implementation of the method that's being called. And did you mention what one implication it has? Sorry, I was uh, messaging the chat. Um, implication, well, I guess the fact that you have to follow the V pointer and it can't be determined at compile time. Um, if, beyond if that, so you mentioned there's a V table, right? Yes. So mm -hmm. what does that table do to the class that it's added to? Uh, so I believe it'll store like a hidden pointer, the V pointer. Um, in the beginning of the class, so essentially all their parameters in the class would be offset by like eight bytes in the 64 bit architecture. So you're saying it'll add eight bytes to the class? Yes. The size, yeah. Okay, that's what I was looking for. Now, while we're talking about the size of classes, um, if I have a class that has a single static variable x, that's an integer, how mm -hmm. much space, how big is that class? I believe, yeah, so I believe that should be one byte just because it needs a distinct address. Um, I guess there's like complexities in that. For example, like if you were to inherit that class, um, so I know something, for example, like std vector will inherit like an allocator class, but because of like uh, like empty base optimization, um, it doesn't actually need to like store any size for that. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, the static data member is stored, not it's not part of that class, it's stored out of it, outside of it. Was that correct that it still takes one, like it's still- Yeah, it would still take one byte because it has no other data. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah. Um, okay. Is it a good idea to have const members in a class? Is it a good idea to have const members in a class? Yeah. I'm getting into something like more practical C++. That's a little sure. bit open-ended because like, you know, a lot of the other stuff. Uh, think, let me just think about this for a second. I'm trying to think of a case where like it would be bad to have a const member. Sure. I, I, I'm thinking like potentially like why we'd have a const member. Um, I think it could make sense. Like you said, like it's members. So this is not like a, a global, um, like const variable. My thought is there could be things that we know wouldn't change. Um, and like they would only be initialized once we wouldn't want them to change afterwards. Um, so I could see like a use case where it would be useful. Maybe if like there's, something you had in mind of like where it'd be problematic, we could look at that. Okay, um, that was not much of an answer. You said it can be useful sometimes and not useful in other times. So right, when... I, I guess, I mean like, I, I don't see a, a problem initially with it. Okay, uh, what implications might, have, might it have on moving the object? Yeah, so like moving the object um, would mean that we'd essentially like transfer control of the const variable to another like instance of the class. Um, but can you do that if they, if it's in, if it's const, you know what I mean? Right, it can't be moved if it's const. Mm -hmm. I mean, from the way you're phrasing the question, I would just, I'm gonna say no. I otherwise didn't initially know there was a problem with that though. I'd, I'd imagine maybe we could, if we're moving it, um, it could still like retain its constness in the new instance. 
No, it would need to uh, occupy a, a, another location in memory, you know, as part of the creation of the new object. Mm -hmm. So it can't be moved, but it can be copied. But it does have the implication that now you need to have a more specific, uh, you need to pay more specific attention to that move operation and those details. I see. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let me ask you about strings a little. I know I'm jumping all over the place, but I'm just trying to test the breadth of your knowledge, if that's okay with you. Yeah, I'm good with whatever. There's two methods. One takes in a const char star, and one takes in a short. And they're both named print. So they're overloads of each mm -hmm. other, the method print. And all they do is they just print out whether it's a const char star or a number, and they just print it. And then I call print with the with the number zero. What get Which one gets called? The... Uh, const char star one or the short one? Sure, when you say number zero, you mean 32 bit integer zero? Yeah. So. I'm I not know, defining 32 like, bit mm -hmm. integer zero first, I'm just typing the number zero on my keyboard. Right, right, okay. Print yeah, um, bracket zero bracket. My thought here is I know like overload resolution will first try like a numer numeric promotion, which I don't think applies here because that would be like a narrow conversion to short. Um, my thought is there maybe be, I, I believe, like an ambiguous conversion. Uh, when trying to convert to either a um, car pointer or too short. Although, I mean, like intuitively, like my thought would be like it would go to like the short. But yeah, I guess, I guess I'm going to say this is probably ambiguous. It is ambiguous. That's right. Yeah. That's a good thought process there. Um, it's ambiguous between the two. So the compiler actually errors. Gotcha. Okay. And it's not that's sure uh, which one is a better or more suitable conversion. What about Figured. this? Let's say I have a const char star, and I have two methods. One that takes in a void pointer, const void pointer, and one that takes in a string. All right, is that the question, essentially, which would overlook result yeah. to? Yeah. Yeah, I believe, um, so I mentioned like the order of like overload resolution. Yeah. Um, I believe here, because car pointer is like, able to convert to void pointer, it would choose that one over um, the conversion to standard string because that's a user-defined conversion, which takes place after um, like numeric conversions. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, I think I'm going to end it there. I mean, uh, you said you're 8 out of 10 relative to your peers. Yeah, I would I would put you there. So, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, good job there. Um, are you in the U.S. or are you uh, abroad? I am in the U.S., yes. Okay, uh, I would say good luck on your internship. Do you have any questions for me now that I've asked you a bunch? Yeah, there was, um, I guess there was one question. I was like scrolling through your Discord a while ago and I saw- Oh, you're you in the Discord. I am in the Discord. Oh, okay. Uh, also, cool. yeah. Um, I, I saw there was some question essentially was like, to what depth should you really like learn a lot of these things? Because, so I've, I've been most recently focusing on C++ and kind of like revisiting some of my OS knowledge. Um, but obviously like there's a lot of other things that I know are tested and I, like, for quant dev roles, such like networking, some like Linux, um, you know, just general, like I guess, you, also talk about like design patterns and whatnot. Um, and what I'm going through now is I'm, I'm very like going pretty in depth on I think C++ and OS are trying to at least, um, but I, I know there's like areas I need to touch on as well before I get into interview processes. Um, and I guess like, because you can really just go forever into C++ or OS, right? And like keep learning more and more and more like minute information. Like what, what do you think is like a good heuristic for when enough is enough and you should like start touching more of like a breadth of topics as opposed to going more in depth into like you know, super weird C++ behavior. Um, I would say that the approach should be before you start, especially when you're young, to, to be to go for breadth. And mm -hmm. then based off the team you're put on, go for depth from there. Some teams use like a crazy template meta program that I, that I look at and I'm like, what the hell is going on here? Right. Gotcha. So then I might pick up a book on templates. I, I picked up a 700 page book on templates. I'm only 100 pages in, but still like some of the stuff still I'm learning new things every day. Right? I'm learning new things about how templates work in C++ every day. And those inspire a lot of the questions on Get Cracked. So what I would do is I would focus on a breadth of knowledge before you start. And then once you start, you can start honing in your skill set and figuring out, okay, I'm going to need to know a bit more about this part of C++ or that part of C++. Because you're right. It's like a massive, it's massive. You'll never in your lifetime understand all of it. Right. Gotcha. Okay, I think that makes sense.